Welcome to January's Tech of the Month, where we discuss all the latest news and reviews. This month, we're going to be taking a look at some of the tech that we're really excited for in 2024. There is a lot to dive into, so I want to start with something pretty contentious because there's a lot of meat on the bone. But wireless brakes, talk to me, Joe. Why do you think that they could be something, one, that we should be excited for, and two, why they'd be any good? Yeah, well, as you say, pretty contentious issue. I think there's a lot of... Um... A lot of people would worry when you start to talk about wireless brakes. Yeah. There are a few things that they'd be really good for. I think the most obvious one is, at least on SRAM's group sets, we are one hose away from totally cableless or wireless yeah. um, operation of the bike, which is it's pretty amazing. But I mean, why would that be good for the man on the street? Why would that be good for right. normal riders? So. First of all, you've got the fact that you could completely get rid of internal cable routing, which uh, any bike mechanic will tell you is kind of probably yeah. still the bane of their life to an extent. Yeah. Um, there's the other thing as well with the safety of headsets and mm -hmm. safety of steerers. So at the moment, a lot of steerer tube fractures are actually due to point loading, due to having split rings. So instead of having a, fully, a full ring around your headset, thanks to um, hydraulic hoses going through the frame, you have to have that split so there's room for them. Yeah. That can cause point loading and therefore fracture, which is, depending on who you speak to, actually kind of quite an issue, at it least is, in bike it's, design. It's, it's a weak spot, so being able to eradicate that weak spot would make them stronger. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other thing is general maintenance. It would just make so much sense to be able to easily swap bars without the stupidly high labour costs that we see to do that. Yeah. Um, the bike shop I used to work in, somebody came in and they wanted their stem lowered by, I think it was eight millimetres. It required two brake bleeds, complete re, re, like recabling of the bike, and I think the labour cost genuinely was £170. That was not overcharged, yeah. that was simply just how long it would take the bike shop to do that job. Yeah. And actually, just to be able to go back to the old days, if you will, but with modern technology, would be really would be a massive gain for consumer and bike shops. Yeah, and I guess when you start to think about it, we it's not actually too far removed from the TRP hydro calipers because we've seen similar things where you have the hydraulic reservoir right next to where the pistons are and having kind of this all-encompassing caliper. The only thing that I can think of in that situation is obviously you've got a cable actuated system there. Um, how much more bulky is it then going to be to have a motor that then actuates it plus a battery to run the whole caliper? You've, you're then ending up with a pretty potentially significantly sized unit right down at the end of your fork. Um, I mean, how bulky is that going to be? For sure, I think that depends on how far into the development cycle you're talking about. I think, and I think this is the big caveat for this one, I think we'll see prototypes next year. I think this is a few years off actually seeing this on our bikes. Firstly, it's going to come to e-bikes first. Yeah. It was the same with DI2, electronic shifting. It makes sense that something that, as you say, is bound to be slightly more bulky will first end up on something where weight is less of a factor. I would argue that in a few years' time, we could definitely see working models that actually don't really detriment aerodynamics too much and also get rid of the cables and say all the benefits that I've talked about. I guess one of the bigger issues though, forgetting about the size and weight of any potential calipers that are wireless, should we trust the technology? I mean, not having that hard link between your brake lever and your brake, that's a big mental hurdle. Certainly that's gonna be a lot of people's biggest worry. And I think rightly so, it's really not natural to not trust a mechanical system. It's what we've been using for so long. However, if you look to other parts of the automotive industry, public transport, we rely on electrical systems absolutely everywhere. But actually, if there's a fail safe built into the bike as well, I don't actually see a reason that we shouldn't trust them. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think with um, with tech like this, you're absolutely right. We would see it on an e-bike first because in that world, you're not as concerned with size or weight. It's more about whether it works well or not. Um, but I don't know. I think I've got more reservations about whether or not it would be even seen on a bicycle first as opposed to seeing it in the automotive world in some form. Um, because I think with something like this, it would just need to go through so many, so many rounds of R&D before it gets to the point where the, the tech is actually flawless and you've kind of built up that trust in the public arena. Moving over from e-bikes to the world of road cycling, we're going to talk a little bit about electronic group sets. That's it, because we think that over the next 12, 24 months, we could potentially see more cheap 
electronic group sets. Um, and we think that SRAM could be leading the way in that market, purely because last year we did see them release SRAM Apex Axis, um, which is their fourth tier, so that sits below SRAM Falls and SRAM Rival. So it's whether or not they could actually bring out a fifth tier Axis group set. We did speak to a spokesperson at SRAM who said that they expect the adoption of electronic group sets to continue across more price points. They didn't want to give a time scale, unfortunately, which isn't all too surprising. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's certainly something that could be coming, as you say, in the next 12, 24 months. Yeah, absolutely. I think it will be really interesting to see how other competitors in the market react to that, because I think from a consumer's point of view, that buzzword of electronic gears, it kind of makes it, makes it seem like anything mechanical just really isn't good enough. Um, yeah. So as we know, Shimano is going to be coming out with Qs in the next couple of years. Um, but before we see Qs Di2, well, that is clearly going to be so far down the line. Um, you potentially have to look towards other rivals that might be bringing out, you know, these budget electronic yeah. group sets. I think you're absolutely right. I think in fairness, Shimano, it's fair to say, has got some work to do. Yeah, um, they're you know, playing catch up big time. They're playing moment. catch up, as as you say, and I think the recent release of the GRX 12 speed in mechanical. Yeah. Well, Shimano said that well, 50% of our customers still buy mechanical shifting. I would argue that a lot of that is down to price in the first place. Yeah, and I think that's the question for the masses of riders that are out there that are on mechanical group sets, and you can look at say Tiagra and below. Um, what's it going to mean for the prices of those bikes? Because currently. There's so much of that product out in the market that you can have something that is slightly affordable at the moment that if we did start to see either a fifth tier Axis group set or something from Shimano land on stock bikes, is that just going to mean that the base level of bikes gets pushed up even higher? Um, and that's my biggest concern is, yeah, what's it going to do to the cost of bikes? Adoption of more electronic group sets, I believe will probably inflate the price more yeah. to an extent. The only thing that would stop that is if actually a budget competitor, like we saw L2 made quite a storm in the social media space early this year, if a brand like that was able to severely undercut SRAM or Shimano and then was adopted by a big major bike brand. And that's the key. That's the key. I think the number of people that go out and buy a group set and then put it on their bike is such a small percentage of the overall market. Like, I'd be amazed if it was even 1% um, that it has to be adopted by one of the really big bike brands for it to actually be a meaningful move for the industry. Um, and then it would only be, it would be kind of a, a budget play. Would, would the brands be able to still sell a bike with electronic gears for less than a thousand pounds, less than a thousand dollars? I don't know. It's certainly a push, but I think arguably a pretty big power move for a big bike brand to choose to partner with one of these more budget group set manufacturers and be able to undercut the market. Mm, I agree. 2024 is an Olympic year, but what is that going to mean for track cycling and track cycling tech? And what's it going to mean for maybe that tech being adopted on the road? What, what are you predicting? As you say, it's an Olympic year. Whenever we get an Olympics, normally we get a huge amount of new developments in tech. Um, the biggest one really that we've seen on a few different bikes, actually in, at the World Championships last year in August, is split seat posts. And we're not talking about sort of the Canyon style seat post that's designed to give sort of some, yeah. some comfort and deflection. Yeah. We're actually talking about sort of having two separate seat posts Side by side, side creating by side. like a Dyson Airblade seat post. Exactly. And mm. that is pretty much the best analogy for these. The idea is that you can accelerate air between a rider's legs and that can help to fill the low pressure area behind the rider's legs, behind sort of behind the lower back. Um, so it's the same kind of concept as like the Trek Madone um, ISO flow. Correct. Um, yeah. But kind of above, a bit higher up. Exactly. Really similar to that. The biggest hurdle here, I think, is the aesthetics. They do look pretty strange. So. You know, for the road bike market, I think that's kind of more of an Achilles than potentially in, on, on the track and in sort of time trialing. But really, I think there's no real reason why we won't start to see them sort of creep into the, the wider road world. Yeah, I think, I think that's one thing is that like with the aesthetics, people get used to aesthetics over time. People tend to hate things when things are new, but then they get used to them and then they accept them and then they want them. I don't necessarily see that as being like the biggest downside in the world. I think what would be interesting is what's it going to do from like a saddle comfort point of view? Like, is that going to mean that you actually lose um, compliance in the seat post? Because obviously there's been a lot of um, R&D recently put into making sure that seat posts do work really well for kind of 
smoothing out the ride as much as possible. So I can see that potentially being a downside. Um, but I mean, it seems to make sense. It's whether or not um, any bike manufacturers would try to build it into their bikes or whether or not it would be an upgrade that people kind of buy from a third party brand like Dorema or someone else like that. From the thrilling world of seat posts to some new fitness tech we may well see in 2024. Indeed. Um, and this is something that actually could be pretty revolutionary within both the pro racing game, but also at grassroots level. Um, Super Sapiens is a company that currently exists and they make glucose monitoring systems. And it's a little patch that sticks on the back of your arm um, and there's a little needle um, which then obtains the data from your blood work. However, currently, they're completely banned from pro cycling. What's exciting though, is that there's a company in Wales called Afon Technology, who's developing a system where they can obtain the same data, but without needing the needle prick in your arm. So don't need to have the risk of infections. Um, and it also means that it would be virtually impossible to ban. Um, the tech is currently in development, but from our point of view, if they develop that and they make it really successful and they make it work, I don't think there's a reason why they then wouldn't just sell that tech to say Garmin or Wahoo or Whoop. Like I think the, or they could just license it out to all, to all these parties. It would be um, it would be pretty revolutionary, I think, and I think it would be a really good thing for the majority of cyclists. For the majority of cyclists, I I, I hold a very different view, to be honest. I think I would genuinely go as far as to say that if this was widely adopted in the pro ranks, it could genuinely, I think, ruin bike racing. Okay, so why do you think that is? A couple of reasons. Um, what it comes down to is that bike racing at the minute is absolutely thrilling due to the fact that so few variables are controlled. A classics race, for example, there's 200 riders on the start line. Any one of those riders could be on a great day. Take out the domestiques and you know communication in the team as to who feels good. On any one day, there's at least 50 riders that could win that race. Yeah. And, that, and the fact that we don't know who's going to win is exactly why it, cycling is so exciting to watch. Yeah. A lot of that comes down to fueling. Look at the Tour de France this year, for example. Yeah. The only the reason behind Taddy Pogacar cracking, as he explained, was due to not being able to take on enough carbohydrate. So if you're able to completely control a rider's glucose levels, for me, I think that could really just take away an element of volatility from racing. I think though that that development and that that progression is kind of inevitable. Um, and I think it feels like what you're arguing for is almost a stunting of development and a stunting of innovation for the sake of good racing. And I mean, arguably, you can see in F1, when teams reach a certain level, um, they really are kind of, it can make racing boring because essentially they've kind of cracked the code. Um, but I think that it is kind of inevitable and maybe there would be more variables being pulled out in different areas of pro racing. But remember, that's only a very small part of cycling because, I mean, the bulk of cyclists are amateurs. Um, so I think if amateurs have a better understanding of what their body's doing, um, how to better utilize their body, and it's even if you're not racing, but if you're anyone who wants to go out on like an ultra ride um, and you need to monitor how many carbs you're getting into your system, that's really critical information. So it could be that the tech is developed. It, I mean, we all know what the UCI is like. If they want to ban something, they will ban it. So absolutely they will. But the problem is they, even if they can ban that in racing, they can't ban someone from wearing smartwatch when they're training. So I think we might see a situation where people learn lots in training, but they can't use it in racing. Yeah. But just going back to the point of view from the wider sort of adoption of that technology, I am more for that because yeah. I can think of many times, particularly when I was a junior, yeah. that I've bonked on rides. It's led me to, in some, some cases, getting ill. And even early last year, I did the Tracker 360, 360 kilometers. And at every single feed station, I was trying to just hack down carbohydrates, literally plain rice, energy bars every half an hour. And actually being able to keep a track on that for ultra riding would have, to be honest, made it safer, actually. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I think there's a lot of merit to the technology and if it does become more widely available, um, which I think having a system which doesn't need to be kind of, you know, have a needle in your arm, then I think that does make the most sense. Um, I think one, the most exciting thing is that this tech is it's right there. We could see it this year and that would be that would be pretty significant for the sport. 
Now, finally, there's one more thing that we're quite excited for, um, but it often feels like we talk about quite often, that being new gearing systems. But you have a pretty strong belief that actually we could be on the verge of something fairly big here. Yes, it's something that we've talked about for quite a few years now, but I genuinely think we really are on the cusp of seeing a lot more development in the world of drivetrains, and that is going away from derailleur gears. Okay, so um, what bikes could we see this on? And is there actually a benefit to the, the end user? Yep, once again, I think e-bikes are gonna see this technology first. A great example, which isn't quite production ready yet, is Driven Technologies Orbit Drive System, which is a planetary gearbox. That won an innovation award last year at Eurobike. But when it comes to the end user, I think really it's something not necessarily for us cyclists, but more something for the wider audience. So something like that Driven Technologies Orbit Drive system can actually, would actually allow you to just jump on an e-bike, choose a cadence, say 80 RPM, 60 RPM. Yeah. Everything else can be done for you. Com total automatic shifting. Yeah. You would just have an ECU unit that chooses how much input comes from the motor, how much from your legs, and from that, how fast you go. Again, all for one cadence. The other thing is maintenance. We once again look to the automotive industry. Gearbox oil, for example, does not need to be changed very often. If something is properly engineered in a sealed system, there's no reason why you wouldn't have to service your gearbox for, say, 10,000 miles, which for a lot of people is probably getting on the life cycle of a bike. Absolutely, could not agree more. I think it would be really interesting to see what it does for, um, I'll say it again, the cost of bikes. Um, however, I think the benefits here could potentially be really outweighing the potential cost. Um, yeah, and once again, going back to why next year? I think the big thing here is e-micro mobility is massively on the rise. It has been for a few years now, but it's getting to the point where actually we're starting to see some bigger players come into the e-bike market. This year, I think we've seen four or five different collaborations with the automotive industry and automotive brands. And once again, that funding is potentially what could just tip us over the edge of seeing something like this come to production. So Joe, out of everything we've spoken about today, what would be your one innovation or trend that you're most excited for above all else? Despite my slander earlier in the video, I think it would have to be the watch technology. Yeah. As I say, I don't think it'd be a great thing for bike racing, but for the wider audience, I think it's really exciting. Yeah. How about enough. you, Sam? I think for me, I think the concept of cheap electronic gears and that being like really widespread i do like the idea of um like i said earlier my biggest concern really is what it will do to the cost of more entry-level bikes if that can be kept in check i think that will be that'll be really really good in the long term let us know down below out of everything we've spoken about today what would you be most excited to see in 2024 if you enjoyed the video then please do drop it a like subscribe to the channel for more content and we will see you again very soon